What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. Honestly, what's cracking? I don't know how I slept last night, but my whole shit feels cracked up right now. Like, oh, it feels like, uh, I don't know, like I snapped my vertebrae or some shit. I need to go to the doctor. I might, next time you see me, I might actually be doing this show from a wheelchair or some shit. It hurts from like, here down to the middle of my bike why is it doing that this is a really weird pain it's not just like some bruise in my neck oh this is gonna be a big complaining episode i got a i got a long day i'm i'm filming this on thursday what do we got to do today i got a call with my my add guy my app guy my tax guy hopefully my sex girl long day but we're here for rankings. We're here for week 11, fantasy rankings, running backs, wide receivers. We'll see if I feel like talking about tight ends or quarterbacks because they don't matter. Not a lot of things matter, all right? But running bikes matter. Wide receivers matter. Tucking our shirts in matters. Oh, I know y'all see the shirts. We are coming out. We are working on an ugly Christmas sweater line, people. An ugly Christmas sweater line. The big dogs will be dropping this winter they're actually in store right now we got four or five designs up in the store right now url will be linked here thank you mr robert and thank you for editing this video as well on bigdogsfantasy.com you guys can't see that this is our first beautiful design i haven't shown animal this yet but i'm going to show them tonight because we're live streaming for the thursday night football game some of you guys probably already watched that thank you for joining us if you did it's probably like some of the most fun content that we actually do on the channel it's very good time. So next time we do it, don't fucking ignore my emails and join us when we do our live stream. So let's tuck our shirts in. Ah. Stop yelling. Let's see. As always, if you just want to skip right to the rankings, y'all could do so at patreon.com forward slash BDGE. You'll get the in-season weekly rankings. You'll get the rest of the season rankings, which are updated right now, real time. And you'll get our dynasty rankings between myself, Michael, and Mr. At FB God of the Bunk Bed Breakdowns podcast. So patreon.com forward slash BDGE, whole lot of perks. We ain't talking Percocets over there. First running back I want to talk about is Damian Harris of the New England Patriots. Now, Damian Harris is my running back 17 right now. Damian Harris has been pretty fantastic over the last month of the season. And uh, I don't really care that Sonny Michelle might or might not be back into the fold here because Damian Harris has kind of seized control of that backfield, right? He's been better over the last month than I feel like Sonny Michelle has been over a, a month period since his rookie year, probably in the playoffs. And he hasn't done shit since then. So there's no reason for the Patriots to put it back on his plate. All right. We look at Damian Harris right now, running really effectively despite. Despite seeing eight man boxes on a league high 43.5% of his carries. No other running back in the NFL is over 34%. So it's clear what this team wants to do. It's clear that they want to run the ball. They want to run the ball. And then when they're done running the ball in the first two downs, they want to run the ball again. Okay. They they do not want to let Cam air the ball out. There was one game, one game earlier in the year against the historically, historically terrible, terrible Seahawks pass defense which was probably lit up by Kyler last night. That was the only game where Cam looked even semi-good. He looked great in that game, but that was the only game he's looked good throwing the ball. That was the only game that this New England passing offense has looked good trying to air the ball out, okay? It's bad. And they are running the ball at the second highest rate in the NFL, again, behind Baltimore, because Baltimore, it th doesn't matter what the score is in the Baltimore games. They could be down 72. They could be up 72. They're running the damn ball, okay? Those hats must sell off the fucking shelves in Baltimore. But the Patriots, second, second highest run rate in the league, 53.8% of their plays are runs. Now, when you look at what Harris has done over the last three games, he's averaging over 17 carries per game. He obviously doesn't add a lot in the passing game, uh, and that is the downfall. That is where the ceiling kind of caps itself. But if you look at what he's done on the ground over the last month of the season, so we're going back to week seven. This is a four-game sample size. Going back to week seven, here are Harris's ranks. He's fifth in carries among all NFL running backs. Third in rushing yards behind only Dalvin Cook, Derrick Henry. He is tied for first 
in 100 plus yard rushing games, second in yards per carry, 5.7 yards per carry over the last month of the season, fifth in yards after contact per attempt. Playing great on the ground, despite the big fact that I dropped at the beginning of this segment, all the eight-man fronts that he is facing. Now, a lot of that has to do with the fact that the defense has to key in on Cam Newton. They have to worry about him taking the handoff, the zone read, whatever the fuck they're doing out there in New England. And that's not going away. Cam is still the quarterback. So as long as he's there, he's going to have those open lanes because the linebackers have to key in on Mr. Cam Newton. Now he gets the Houston Texans in week 11. And this is, you know, you want to talk about historically bad defenses. I brought up Seattle. Now listen to this. Houston has a bottom five run grade per PFF, bottom five tackling grade, and they are dead last per football outsiders in terms of run defense. They have allowed the second most fantasy points to running backs on the year. And more importantly for Harris, they have allowed the single most rushing yards among any NFL team this year, 250 more rushing yards than the next closest team. They are on pace to allow, I forgot to put the stat in here, but I tweeted it out yesterday and Robert's going to put it on the screen. I want to say it was like, they're on pace to allow 2,439 or 69 rushing yards on the season which would be the single most rushing yards since the 2008 Detroit Lions. If you remember closely, the Detroit Lions of 2008, the fans looked a lot like Animal did during our Fade the Public filming yesterday with bags over their head because they're so fucking ashamed of their team. This this team is on pace for a historically, historically bad rushing defensive year. Damian Harris is playing really well. I think this makes a lot of sense. It's so chalky that it actually might not work. But Damian Harris, I think, is a rock-solid RB2 who we can expect to get 18-plus carries. We'll have to see what happens on the goal line, but he's running well. I think we're in store for a nice game from Mr. Damian Harris. So the rest of the running backs I have prior to Damian Harris at running back 17 are all pretty much tit for tat, titty for tatty with ECR. I don't have him ranked too high or too low, except for DeAndre Swift. Right now, he is the consensus RB5 per ECR. I think that's a little ignorant, a little naive. Y'all know that no one really likes DeAndre Swift more than I do. I'm not sold that he's a sure thing RB1. Like, listen, I want to see a streak of a month where we know he's the featured workhorse before I'm going top five. Like, we're going to rank him over Nick Chubb and Miles Sanders and Mike Davis. I think we need to slow our roll a little bit. So I got DeAndre Swift down at, like, running back 13, which I think is fine. Like, obviously, he's someone that you want in your lineup, but RB5. Like, there's a lot of guys that I would still start over him. But RB13 seems about right. I think people are getting a little bit carried away there um, coming off the big game. I do like the direction they're going with the offense and how much they're giving Swift the ball. But, you know, this is Matt Patricia. And we don't know at at any minute, at any moment, he could hand the ball off to Adrian Peterson 12 times in the game. I think I'm just going to throw up on the screen. Pause. I'm not going to throw up on the screen. I'm going to post on the screen right now my rankings for running backs 20 through 27 because I think there's a lot to uncover here. And then after 27, it gets really, really fucking ugly. So we have Kalen Blage up at number 20 and Kenyon Drake at 21, which are both three spots higher than ECR has them. Kalen Blage just has a great matchup against the New York Jets, and he's clearly, clearly the number one right there, right? Justin Jackson's on the IR. Eckler's still on the IR. Tremaine Pope did not play at all last week. And it's just Joshua Kelly behind him, who clearly they do not trust whatsoever. He's like the RB5 on the depth chart right now. So it's Caitlin Blas's job. He's a, he's a pass catcher. He's not a good runner. He's not good on the ground, but they're giving him 18 to 20 carries. And he's catching, you know, three to five passes per game, operating as the primary back. And this is a terrible defense they're going against. It's going to be Joe Flacco time over there. So I like Caitlin Blas easily as a top 20 running back. Right now, I think you start him in your lineups if you have him. Kenyon Drake, I'm a lot less high on because the Seattle, actually, it doesn't fucking matter because they already played last night. So whatever I say is going to be hold against me in the court of law. And I'm not saying anything because then you guys can't bully me on the internet. Ronald Jones is right after him. Uh, I have him four spots lower again because this LA defense is very, very good. And same thing with like DeAndre Swift. I don't fully trust Bruce Arians to just go right back to Ronald Jones. I'm going to minimize this so you all can see my pretty ass face. I don't trust Ronald Jones to be like a locked and loaded RB2. I still think in a normal game script, which it should be against the Rams or a good D, we know how the backfield is going to work out in certain game scripts. Like we don't know how the game is actually going to play itself out, but if they're playing a shitty team like they did last week against Carolina, they run up the score, Ronald Jones is going to get a lot of work. If they're playing from behind, they're in a close game, you're probably going to see a little bit more Leonard Fournette work. So for a backfield that I still think is going to be splitting 50-50, I'm not as confident in Ronald Jones as a lot of people clearly are as running back 18. And we have Salvin Ahmed 
Very similar to Kalen Balaj in the fact that they clearly trust him. The coaching staff trusts him, and a lot of the players are still out. Miles Gaskin's out. They cut Jordan Howard. So it's his backfield. 18 carries last week, got into the end zone. And uh, Denver's not necessarily a scary defense to be going against. So I like I like Salvin Ahmed. And then we have J.D. McKissick right behind him who's getting a shit ton of passing work. My only concern with J.D. McKissick this week, which is why I'm not as high. I know he's seen 29 targets over the last two weeks, which is just an insane fucking amount of work in the passing game. And Alex Smith just dumps the ball off left and right. But those are two very good game script games for Washington. High paced, high scoring, trying to catch up. I don't know if we get that against Cincinnati. This could be like a shitty, low scoring, not good offensive game where J.D. McKissick doesn't play that much of a role. He's also not like a very explosive player. He doesn't make big plays. So if the volume's not there to a really high degree, like he had 15 targets last week. I'm pretty sure he ended up with like 45, 50 receiving yards. So he needs the volume in order to be successful. And I'm not as confident that he gets it this week, though he's still like a flex play that should be in your lineup. Rex Burkhead, another one that I've been high on the last two weeks, right? He was like my sleeper pick two weeks ago. And then I liked him again last week because this offense is just involving their running back so fucking heavily in this game. They don't have wide receivers to make plays right now. And they're running it again at the second highest rate in the entirety of the NFL. So yes, while I expect Damian Harris to eat, like Rex Burkhead is also a guy who's getting five to 10 carries plus three to five targets a game. And again, this is a super soft run defense to go against in Houston. So again, Rex Burkhead has just as good of a chance to get into the end zone as any player on that New England team. If Sonny Michelle does end up suiting up, they activate him and they play him a little bit. You know, if we know he's going to be healthy and active for game day, I still think Damian Harris is definitely the guy back there, but I would probably pull back a little bit on Rex Burkhead's role and see that like RB2 slot be a little bit more of a committee than anything else. But I feel like Sonny Michelle is kind of injured himself out of the depth chart there for the Patriots. So I feel okay putting Rex Burkhead in there. Clearly, I feel better than I do about uh, Melvin Gordon because I got him right behind him at running back 26. Miami, tough defense overall still. And just Melvin Gordon's been shit. This whole Denver backfield has been shit over the last couple of weeks. Drew Locke might be out for this game, which is going to cause a lot of problems for anyone in, on, on this offense overall. So I'm not confident in Melvin Gordon whatsoever. Clearly, he's out of the RB2 range for me, more in the flex role. And even then, I, I would hope I'd have like a better wide receiver or one of these other running backs to play above him. And right behind him is LaMichael Pirine. And I really don't like LaMichael Pirine as a prospect. And I think like it's it's not a confident play whatsoever. But of all the other guys like sitting behind these running backs 20 through 27, none of them are guys I'm confident in. Another, none of them are guys that I really want to throw into my lineup. Even like Jonathan Taylor against Green Bay, like, yes, again, but the same argument I made last week. This guy's getting 25 to 30% of the snaps. He's not catching passes anymore. We don't know who's going to be on the goal line. So, yes, of course, in his range of outcomes is, you know, taking 12 carries for 65 yards and getting one of the one-yard scores. But, like, we haven't seen it in a while. And I'm not about to waste a roster spot hoping on a 25% chance that that does happen. Well, Michael P. Ryan, the, the reason he's up this high, we haven't really seen much from him, but there was a report that surfaced that they're going to be using him as the workhorse going forward to see what they have for the future. So it looks like Frank Gore is going to take a bike seat. Michael P. Ryan is going to pop in here. And uh, I expect him to catch a lot of passes because he was a pass catcher coming out of uh, college. He caught like 40, 45 passes last year at Florida. That's the role he'll probably have. And I mean, listen, if you're going to be a three-down workhorse on any offense, it's good enough to probably get into your flex spot. So I don't hate LaMichael Pirine this week. You know what else I don't hate? And we went, we swung for the absolute fucking fences on this one. We sw we went nuts last night, a monkey knife fight. I have no idea how it worked out. We're going to check the bet that I made. We did a six for six, more or less last night right here, which 35x the money. I guarantee we hit it. I guarantee we turned that 20 into 700. We had Wilson under 315. I probably just lost it right there. Whatever. We're talking about the new games for this upcoming weekend. Star shootout, early games, touchdown dance. Who's getting in? All we need is these three players to combine for three total touchdowns. Passing, receiving, Kamara against the Falcons, fucking lock. Derek, uh, I'm actually going to go with Mike Davis against the, who the fuck's Carolina playing? Carolina's got a shitty, shitty, all, uh, Detroit. Detroit, Detroit, Detroit. Like Mike Davis's chance of getting in. And then I'll leave this third spot open for y'all, open for y'all's interpretation, okay? So again, you can't hold this against me in the court of law, but we're going Kamara, we're going Mike Davis, and I'm just going to close my eyes and pick somebody as the third guy. All right, we'll have James Conner in there, but that's not who I would actually pick. Once you do so, you're going to one and a half X your money. Though 10, you're going to win 15. You want to go four touchdowns between the three of them? That's going to turn your 10 into 30, plus the 10 that you got back. However, 
if you deposit on Monkey Knife Fight for the first time and you use the promo code BDGE when you do so, they're going to double your deposit. All right. So you, you get 10, they're going to give you 20. You get 20, they're going to give you 40. Up to $50, which will get you $100. You could put the $100 on the touchdown dance and it will three times your money. So you get the 50, turn it into 100, turn the 100 into 300. Now you got $400 in your bank account and some of y'all can actually pay rent this month for the first time in years. Okay. Let's talk about wide receivers. Let's get the shadow matchups out of the way. Let me get this piece of beautiful wizardry up on the screen. Okay. So these are the three projected shadow matchups for week 11. Marquise Brown's supposed to get shadowed by Malcolm Butler, who's been very good this year. I mean, Marquise Brown is just not a guy you can have in your lineup right now. Zero confidence in Marquise Brown up to this point. DJ Moore expected to get Desmond Trufant. However, when you look at PFF and Player Profiler, PFF has Trufant shadowing more, but Player Profiler has Trufant on Robbie Anderson. And as we'll see in my rankings in a little bit, I have these two guys back to back in my rankings. I got DJ Moore, I think, at wide receiver 19 and Anderson at 20, or it's 20 and 21, because the matchup is juicy regardless. Desmond Trufant fucking stinks, so regardless of who he's on, maybe he doesn't shadow anybody. Maybe the confusion between the two sites means that there is no shadow coverage coming. Regardless, both of them have great matchups, and I like both of them. Jacoby Myers is supposed to get shadowed by Bradley Roby, which is actually like semi-interesting because Myers has obviously been great over the last month of the season, seeing so many targets from the Patriots offense and, and Cam Newton there. And I'm expecting... So here's the, here's the reason I'll probably have Myers a little bit lower than consensus because one... As I said before, like the Patriots run the ball and 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 and that will mean less passes, okay? You run the ball more, you pass the ball less. And this is a Houston defense that's going to be run on. They're going to get their train run on. Bradley Roby's actually been very good. As you can see, PFF top 25, player profiler top 30. So consistency between the rankings there. Those are the shadow matchups for this week or expected shadow matchups for the week. So interesting, interesting, uh, Actually, extremely uninteresting shadow matchups for the week. Let's talk about some guys I'm higher or lower on this week than consensus. I have Jarvis Landry up at wide receiver 26. ECR has him at wide receiver 36, all right? It's a good matchup, and they're not being played in 37 fucking miles per hour wind, all right? The Eagles, now the Eagles are not necessarily a great matchup for opposing offenses or opposing wide receivers, but if you look at some of the games that they've allowed, some of the bigger games they've allowed to fantasy wide receivers, it has come from the slot. We have Sterling Shepard with a 6 for 16 to touchdown. Tyler Boyd went 10 for 125. Cooper Cup, 5 for 80. So uh, we have these slot wide receivers, and then obviously OBJ is out for the season. We have a team that uh, doesn't have a lot of targets to go to different pass catchers and weapons and shit like that. So I like Jarvis Landry's chances of being heavily involved in this offense. The first game OBJ was out of the lineup, Jarvis Landry saw 11 targets, okay? And that's kind of the workload I'm expecting him to see. They might not be the most valuable targets, and I don't know how much he's going to do with them, but anytime you can get a guy that's getting, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11 plus targets, you're going to feel pretty fucking good about it being in your flex spot. So I think this is a little bit of recency bias because the game that they just played, you know, Baker Mayfield wasn't throwing the ball. So uh, I, I like Jarvis Landry up there as a wide receiver three kind of flexish spot. And Kenny Galladay is expecting to play, or at least he practiced it on a limited basis on Wednesday. I have him up at wide receiver 15. So typically I have him a little bit higher than that, uh, but I don't know if he's going to be 100% they're playing at Carolina. So wide receiver 15 factors in a little bit of floor, a little bit of ceiling. And I'm a little bit nervous about whether or not he's actually going to be healthy for this game. And as I said in the rest of the season wide receiver rankings video earlier this week on, on Tuesday, I think I put it out for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Every week going forward is probably going to be the same thing unless we're explicably told that Deontay Johnson or one of these guys is getting shadow coverage from the opposing top cornerback. It's going to be Deontay. It's going to be Juju, and it's going to be Claypool. In that order, in my rankings. Right now, I have Deontay up at wide receiver 13. I have Juju at wide receiver 14, and I have Claypool at wide receiver 17. So all really good starts. High-end wide receiver twos, if, yeah, a little bit lower to mid wide receiver two for a guy like Chase Claypool. But all really good starts. All guys I would like to have into my lineup, uh, you know, playing at Jacksonville. Definitely a pass defense that we can exploit. Now, speaking of Jacksonville. DJ Chark, I have down at wide receiver 34, and ECR has him at 26. So I'm eight spots lower, and this is for a few reasons. This is a tough matchup against Pittsburgh. Now, they have not been great against the pass. They have not been great against covering opposing wide receivers, but he's going to see Joe Hayden, okay? DJ Chark's going to see Joe Hayden, and in coverage, 
coverage rating per player profiler. Joe Hayden is number seven in the NFL, okay? And this is a free tool for you guys, right? You can go to player profiler right now. You can type in any wide receiver you want, and you could see his wide receiver matchup, what cornerback is going to be supposedly on him, who we're expecting to cover that wide receiver, and what ranking they have in coverage, right? This is free, free information, free material on playerprofiler.com. So if you go there, type in DJ Chark, you'll see Joe Hayden pops up, and he's the number seven cornerback in coverage. It's extremely useful information to have. So it's not something we want to see from a Chark owner. The other thing that I'm concerned about in this matchup is the the matchup favor for the Pittsburgh Steelers rush, right? They're not great in coverage, but their pass rush is fucking ferocious. Now, the Steelers blitz at the third highest rate of any team in the NFL, 41.7%. Jake Luton, in his two starts so far, has completed five of 24 passes while under pressure. That is 20.8%. That is the second lowest rate in the entire NFL among quarterbacks during that time. I don't like the formula here, okay? A lot of pressure coming from Pittsburgh and a lot of shitty passes coming out of Luton's hands when he's under pressure. And maybe maybe it, it means less of a down day for DJ Chark and maybe just a shitty overall day for the Jaguars offense. And he could pop off one or two big plays. But I think it's just going to be a rough day overall for Jacksonville. And I'm not very confident in DJ Chark right now. We're going to continue to see a little bit of inconsistency as Jake Luton is the quarterback under center. So he's not unstartable, but he is my wide receiver 33. So that's like wide receiver three, flexish, flexi, flexi range for Mr. DJ Chark, you know. And the Tampa Bay wide receiver group is is interesting this week as well. So I actually like Chris Godwin the most out of these three guys. I know this is like another guessing game, like the fucking Steelers trio of wide receivers there. But I have Chris Godwin up at wide receiver 18. And I moved him up there. Actually, no, he's been up there for a while. So I have him at 18. ECR is him at 23. Evans, I have down at 28. ECR is him at 27. Antonio Brown, I have at 37. And that's exactly where ECR has him. Now, when you look at the matchup, the Rams have been really, really fucking good against wide receivers, like top, top, top fucking notch. OK, uh, and Jalen Ramsey is expected to stick on to Mike Evans again. Go over to playerprofiler.com, type in Mike Evans and you will see Jalen Ramsey pop up. He is ranked very, 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 very high. You can go over there and check out the ranking for yourself. Ramsey shut down DK Metcalf last week. They are not too dissimilar in terms of their play style. DK Metcalf, Mike Evans, get down the field, make big plays down the field, right? Ramsey has no difficulty sticking with the big, fast type of wide receivers. He's an alpha cornerback. He's paid to stick to alpha wide receivers. AB is a little bit shaky in terms of like what we can expect, right? He hasn't had a blow up game yet. And the opposite cornerback of Jalen Ramsey is this dude, Darius Williams, who a lot of you guys probably don't know about, and I didn't really know too much about him before I started looking into the gradings and the coverage and shit like that. He's been tremendous this year, and it's a big reason why the Rams' pass defense has also been really, really good this year. Third best coverage grade behind Jair Alexander and Bryce Callahan. So Evans and AB both have really, really tough matchups on the outside. Godwin gets by far and away the easiest matchup against Troy Hill in the slot. Now, Troy Hill has been terrible this year. He is the weak spot to attack in this offense in the in a passing offense against this pass defense. And the other thing about AB being the lowest and the reason he's 10 spots behind Evans and almost 20 spots behind Chris Godwin is he was kind of the odd man out last week. When you look at the snap counts, Godwin played 72, Mike Evans played 64, and AB played 39. So uh, almost double the snaps for Chris Godwin. If that's going to be the case, I mean, that's the immediate tiebreaker, and that's the reason you move him that much further down the rankings than the other two up top. So when they're not in three wide receiver sets, AB is the guy that comes off the field. And it's kind of surprising because AB's looked fine. He's looked good. He's looked, he's able to separate and whatever. But Tom Brady likes to pick up, pick apart the defense however he wants to do it. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't look great either, but he's not, he's not a guy who's going to force the ball into any one player's, you know, hands down the field, whatever it is. So AB's furthest down the list for me. I've got Jerry Judy down at wide receiver 40. ECR is him at 33. Um, I guess Jerry Judy's just been a guy I've been consistently a little bit lower on. I think this is definitely a week to kind of avoid him because Miami's pass defense has been really good between Xavier Howard and, and the cornerbacks that they have over there. Plus, Drew Locke is, is unlikely or at least limited and might not play this weekend. So I think there's a lot of kind of red flags there. Right behind him is Michael Pittman. Michael Pittman has taken over as the alpha in this Indy Colts passing offense. Looked fucking fantastic last week. Plays Green Bay. I'm not sure. We're not expected Jair Alexander to, if he does even play, because he didn't suit up last week. If he doesn't suit up again this week, I actually really like attacking Michael Pittman as a, as a really strong flex play. 
Jerry Alexander plays this week, it'll be interesting to see if he sticks on T.Y. Hilton or Michael Pittman. And then I have Mike Williams down at wide receiver 44, nine spots lower than consensus. Who else we got? Sammy Watkins is returning. He's my wide receiver 49, so I'm definitely not looking to throw him back into the lineup. But I guess you could fucking do worse, really. Yeah, you can't really do much worse, but you, I guess you could do worse. That's really all we got for the wide receiver rankings. We could dive into some tight ends. I have most of my rankings like very, very similar to ECR. Again, y'all could see the rankings, patreon.com forward slash BDGE. You sign up. There you get a ton of exclusive shit. Gronk, I'm five spots higher on. Uh, I have him at tight end three. I don't understand why we need to keep waiting. Gronk at this point has like been one of the best fantasy tight ends in the league, and he's done it for almost a month straight or a month and a half straight. Can we look at his fucking stat lines right now? Hold on, I'm going to pull them up for you. Like, yes, it's a tough matchup, but last five games... Since all the injuries occurred to the tight end position over there, five for 78 and a touchdown, five for 62 and a touchdown, four for 41 and a touchdown. Had the absolute dud game against New Orleans in week nine, but last week, two for 51 and a touchdown. So a touchdown in four of the last five games, getting targets, catching the ball. I don't know what more we need to see from Gronk to stop ranking him as like a low end tight end one. I don't care what the matchup is against the Rams. The Rams are going to be able to shut down the wide receivers, which means they're probably going to funnel a few more targets to Gronkowski. And then I have Jared Cook up at tight end nine where he is tight end 13 in the ECR, which I think is a little bit low considering they're playing against the Falcons and you're going to attack the Falcons via the pass. And I know Drew Brees is going to be out, but Jameis Winston is a guy who loves to throw his tight ends as well, right? Especially in the red zone. And that's where Jared Cook can score a lot of touchdowns. That's what he's done over the last couple of years in New Orleans. Remember how, how many fucking targets that like Cameron Brake got down there from Jameis Winston. So I like Jared Cook as a pretty solid tight end one here up at tight end nine. Let's look at some defenses. I got Steelers as a one. If the Chargers are still out there on your wire, I would definitely start them against the Sam Darnold list New York Jets. I like Miami at Denver. Cleveland versus Philly at home is one of my favorites that I have higher than consensus right now. Again, I love streaming teams at home. I think there's a big mismatch between Cleveland's defensive line and Philly's offensive line, which will lead to a lot of pressure, a lot of sacks, a lot of plays in the bike field, a lot of strip sacks for touchdowns, a lot of them. I'm talking like 42 points from the Cleveland fantasy defense. Okay. That's all I got for y'all today. That is it. That's all I have for you today, except for tonight when we live stream. Make sure that you have notifications turned on for the videos because when we live stream, it'll notify you when we do so. And I do I do live streams throughout the week. I do I do live streams tomorrow. I do a Q&A for the Patreon members. So another reason to sign up. It is a premium Q&A only for the Patreon members, but I'll put it up on YouTube afterwards. You can still watch. Maybe some of the guys that you have questions about are included in the Q&A. So sign up on patreon.com forward slash BDG. Hit the notification button. Again, it's a little bell down there. It looks like this fucking Wu-Tang kind of shit. Hit that. It'll let you know when I go live for the waiver wire and recap video every Monday that I do, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure you go to monkeyknifefight.com. And when you deposit, use a promo code BDGE. That's it. I will see y'all uh, on tomorrow's live stream. Good luck in week 11. And um, I'm going to drink the rest of this shitty coffee. You see that pun right there? You see that fucking pun right there? Did you see that fucking pun?